The Stanley Parable is known as one of the most popular walking sims of the genre, with a sense of lighthearted comedy, deep messages, and jovial narrator. It was first released in 2013 and was made by Galactic Cafe, a team of two guys, Davey Readham and William Pugh. Although there might have been a few other people that worked on the original game, these two are the ones that are mostly credited for the game. Davey is known for his game called The Beginner's Guide. Hmm, how familiar. One of my favorite games of all all time. And William is known for establishing Crows Crows Crows, an indie game development studio that has helped develop not only the Stanley Parable, but Accounting and Accounting Plus, which was in association with Squanch Games, Justin Roiland's game studio, one of the co-creators of Rick and Morty. In any case, there are 20 endings in the original game, however, one of the original endings isn't present in the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, which means that the Spud version has 19 original endings. I can't remember if I got all of the endings in the original or not, but regardless, the original game was definitely a classic in the indie space for a long time. This is why, in 2018, Crows 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 announced that they were releasing the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe in 2019. Wait, hold on. No, that's not right. Sorry. <clears throat> This is why, in 2019, Crows 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 announced that they were releasing the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe in 2020. Um... Wait, hold on, that, that doesn't feel right. Are you kidding? One second. This is why, in 2021, Crows 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 announced that they are releasing the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe in 2022. Now, imagine that same joke, except stretched over three years instead of 40 seconds. Now my joke doesn't seem that long, does it? They made it seem like Spud, because I'm not gonna say the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe every single time was the base game, but with new content added. So to me, they made it feel like that they were updating the game with higher res graphics and adding more content on top of that, and expanded reimagining of the original work. Which as a fan of the original game, I found that premise exciting, which means you don't need the original game to play this one. Although if you did have the original version, you actually got a discount of 33% off of the new version for the first two weeks, which was nice of the devs, but knowing me by the time this video comes out, the discount probably just won't be available anymore. So, uh, Oops. Almost an entire decade after the original game, Spud was announced with the date 427, which is Stanley's office number. That is genius. Literally that alone got me super excited that they were waiting for a very specific release date, which told me that there was going to be a lot of attention to detail in this game. So. With Davey writing the game, William with his development studio, and Kevin Brighting still as the narrator, a familiar intro plays. Stanley worked for a company in a big building where he was employee number 427. Once I booted the game, I looked at the brand new accessibility settings that I believe were not in the original game, since it was one of many of the brand new features that were added. Here we can see... Oh, that's odd. Well, that definitely won't come up later. Whenever I play a new game, I like to use a controller since it's better on my wrists than using keyboard and mouse. These are still connected. I didn't unplug them. I even move, accidentally moved my camera trying to do this bit. But with this game, I could tell it's not built for controller. Oh. Dang it. Since the controls between mouse and controller feel completely different in terms of sensitivity. If you set the sensitivity too low, the character just feels unnatural. But if you set it too fast, it's really hard to control. So I recommend a keyboard and mouse with this one, which bumped me out a little bit, especially because this game was also ported to consoles, though it didn't take away from the overall experience of the game. In this office, there's a bunch of ways to play, since choices actually matter in this story, because it's not just a bunch of paths leading down to one specific ending. Looking at you in space with Markiplier. <laughs> in this game, there are at least 28 new endings and 19 original endings, which means there are 47 endings in total. Like, sure, you can beat the game in like 10 minutes by following every single instruction that the narrator gives you, but sometimes what you're supposed to do isn't actually what you're supposed to do. You have the choice to go where you want to go, whether it's finding this weird, white void place, which I don't know if this is technically an ending or not, or a bug. All that really happens is just that music swells, which is oddly relaxing, 
or just waiting in a room to see if the narrator notices your uncooperation. Jokes are so elegantly woven in this game, whether in the form of verbal, environmental, or when the narrator, if provoked enough, doubles down on a joke to create a ridiculous situation. Wait, why is it doing that? What, what does this say? If you choose to discuss the game's major story beats and twists, we kindly ask that you include an appropriate spoiler warning and don't reveal them in your title or thumbnail. So yeah, past this point, there's going to be spoilers because there's no way I can talk about or also. So basically, I highly recommend you play the game first. I find it very enjoyable to play the game without knowing anything about the new content, which is how I recommend you play it. The Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe stood out to me as a thought-provoking game due to its subject matter that's dissected in the game. Topics of comedy, the game industry, fans, internal feelings, the bucket, memories, and achievements are all covered in this game in great detail to portray a meta-comedic commentary about our world. From the perspective of comedy, there's a new door added to this game. This moment is a total buildup for what's to come. As the narrator speaks his excitement, the comedic tension rises as you pass through this corridor with both an elevator and a roller coaster presentation. This heightens your sense of what could possibly be the brand new content you've been waiting three years for. All right, finally, at long last, it's on to the new content. I've never been more ready. Let's do it. Let's see the content. Give me the content, Stanley. All right. All right, let's see. It's... The jump circle? I died of laughter at the jump circle, which perfectly showed the setup, the punchline structure of a good joke. The setup was the content door, the beat was the presentation, and the punchline was the jump circle, which means that this one joke lasted about two and a half minutes, categorizing this joke as a slow burn joke. Some of my favorite jokes, honestly. A work of art, if you ask me. The whole point of this joke is that you can't jump in the base game, but now you can. However, only in the circle. Why am I stuck in the ground? Somebody please help. Help! There are a lot more jokes in this game, some of which I won't bore you with the details on, but dissecting the very first joke of the new content shows how they not only use the game delays to their advantage, but that they know how to correctly tell a joke to make it land. No pun intended because this is about the jump circle, which is funny due to the fact that comedic timing actually gets brought up if you go down a certain path, as if the narrator just doesn't know how to tell a joke. If you ignore the narrator's instructions, while holding the bucket, the narrator assumes that Stanley thinks the bucket talks, leading to a rant from the narrator about jokes and comedy, which leads to a video teaching you about comedic timing, doubling down on the initial joke, a concept that is done very well in this game on several occasions. Down one path, if you annoy the narrator enough, he'll literally just give up and put you in another game, a reveal that was hilarious, since it was not only unexpected, but falling onto that trope of doubling down on a joke, where you think the joke ended, but still continues to further create that overall joke that it's going for. There's also a beginner's guide reference in this game, and I very much appreciate that. While the Stanley Parable has been around for almost a decade at this point, it's taken the liberty in Spud to take a crack at commentating about the overall game industry. In one such way, the monetization of video games makes its appearance in the form of an audio tape hidden in the back rooms. No, no, not that back room, this one. It's unthinkable the amounts of money people will pay for even just an hour with the bucket. Although the tape is talking about the bucket, the overall message is that it is referring to the game industry monetizing content in their game. In another sense, the Stanley Parable 2, which I not only was shocked about, but it was the thing that the dev said not to screenshot. And rightfully so, because this is one of the best sections of the game, which talks about sequels to games and the 
unpolished nature of some games that are rushed. Well, we're not gonna name names here, but you all know exactly what we're talking about here. Of course, you can't have a successful game without the fans. This is why in the Bucket Intervention story, the narrator talks about giving the fans what they want, because the game also wanted to touch on the consumer side of the game industry. On a deeper level, this game gets into some real feelings to deal with. Jealousy makes an entrance by Stanley listening to the bucket, following every word it says. The narrator thinks Stanley is mentally insane at this point due to only taking orders from the bucket, which makes the narrator jealous of the bucket and eventually wants to be with the bucket instead of Stanley. Anxiety also makes a cameo with a very specific path that you can really only find if you hear the narrator mention Stanley's urge to press 3 on a keypad over and over again, which leads you to going up and down the elevator until finally the elevator leads you to a press conference to talk about Stanley's obsession with the number three. This is where anxiety pops its head up because of course no one showed up, which not only showcases the anxiety of public speaking, but the anxiety of the worst case scenario. Nobody being there to listen to you. By this point, if you're one of the people that didn't care about spoilers, or if you came back after playing Spud like I instructed you, you may have noticed a specific trend in the new content. I must really like potatoes. This bucket is honestly one of the most genius things in this game that definitely shows more than it tells. It not only changes some of the dialogue, but there are some different endings if you use the bucket. Whether it be a fake game show, is this a bucket? Where the more you antagonize the narrator, he threatens to delete all bucket. Where'd my bucket go? Or the bucket museum. The whole reason for the bucket in the first place is to make the point about the unpolished nature of some rushed games. This is now my head. As long as you hold onto the bucket, the many disorienting contradictions of the Stanley Parable will feel perfectly normal. And to be honest, it's a much more convenient solution for me than actually redesigning the game to be less uncomfortable. Once the point of the bucket is revealed. If you go through the first content door with the bucket, it then proves to the narrator that the bucket being a sequel content worked, making the joke last even longer than I originally thought. Although, speaking of thoughts, I think I forgot to mention something. Oh right, the memory zone. If you go down the vent path, you notice that the narrator got fed up with the new content. So he decided to make his own content, the memory zone, a place for Stanley Parable memorabilia. This building ties in real world reviews, which are the ones that gave the Stanley Parable a highly praised score. But of course, you can't have the good reviews without the bad reviews, which means yes, even the Steam reviews. Honestly, I could not be bothered to play this game to full completion. The narrator is obnoxious and unfunny with his humor and dialogue proving to be more irritating than entertaining. I just love how gloomy the Steam review section is because it is a perfect representation of how it feels when you look at bad reviews of a game when you know the game is good because you played it and you actually like it. This, of course, gets in the narrator's head as he spouts off about cancel culture, leading him to add a skip dialogue button since some of the reviews asked for it. I wish there was a skip button. A skip button? Well, well, yes. Yes, I think we can do that. If I'm truly too preachy then, then maybe letting you skip ahead for just a moment, surely it couldn't hurt. But then this whole situation makes a joke about itself because if you use the button enough, it makes the game feel empty, which eventually makes you happy when he does come back. Which proves how the narrator really didn't drone on and on in the original game. Because in this game, the narrator did exactly that to prove the point in a literal way, to juxtapose with the first game. Honestly, this is probably one of the funniest bits in the entire game, specifically because of how dedicated they were with it. Giving the fans what they want, yet doubling down to prove the point of how over-exaggerated the review was. While this memory zone is a very fond and hilarious 
hilarious section to the game, there's another section that makes the point about spending your time wisely. When the bucket is now available to grab whenever you want, collectible figurines are now hidden in the game, and some hints as to where to find them are now in the meeting room since they updated it. Throughout the entire journey of collecting these Stan Lorenes, it's a subtle commentary on how pointless it is to 100% a game by collecting every single collectible just to get nothing in return. Just like my Funko Pop collection! So pointless that it makes you collect more Stan Lorenes than the right number says. Because the narrator unloaded the screen, which was hilarious in its own right, and wanted you to collect all of them again so he can relive his memory, making the number of Stan Lorenes not only pointless since you went past the threshold, but that the narrator has a hard time with living in the moment and letting go of the past, even to the point where you go to the memory zone multiple times in this one situation alone, remembering your steps all the way back to Stanley's office, where it's revealed that the narrator made Stanley up. Wow, that's... <laughs> was not expecting that. As to say that the narrator felt lonely and wanted someone else to make his decisions for him as a distraction from his decision making. So not only was the narrator dealing with having troubles of moving on in the collectibles section, but then learns how to accept his feelings and move on with his life by being real with himself and his situation, which showed the growth of the narrator. And in my opinion, makes this the true ending of the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe. Once you collect all the Stan Lorenes, the epilogue is now unlocked. This epilogue is honestly the whole epitome of the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe experience, except in a few short minutes. The choices, comedy, and commentary are all here, but with a twist. You start a few scenes in a deserted area to show the passage of time, then the memory zone appears, leading you to the reviews of the sequel, showing the fans' reaction. There's finally a button that says, Stanley's name instead of Jim, a callback to the sequel content, and a joke in and of itself because the intent was to make the button say the player's name, which proves that the narrator got it eventually right amongst the feeling of failure. It then ties in the settings screen person at the beginning of the game, where the more you boot up the game, the more this character appears. Well now, this computer's whole existence is to make more Stanley Parable sequels, which in turn literally changes the game's name in the start menu as to make the point of game companies shelling out sequels until their reputation is buried. I love how much this game says, and the way they execute their ideas in the form of lighthearted comedy. It's not just funny for funny's sake, it brings up real life situations that are worth thinking and questioning. This time around, the topics of comedy, the game industry, monetization, sequels, fans, feelings of jealousy, anxiety, and isolation, memories, reviews, cancel culture, and spending your time wisely are dissected with a brilliant grasp of comedic elements that make the overall experience engaging and entertaining. If you haven't played the original, play the Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe, because it's like you're getting two games in one. Although, I... Probably should have said that earlier since everybody who didn't want spoilers already left. You know the deal. We got some brand new music. This time around, it is a summer track from my upcoming summer EP. So good warm vibes all around. Check it out. Why are you the way that you, why aren't you clicking? We've had this conversation last time. Just, I click the, click, click the video, click the video.